Is that some way to turn the music? Yeah, it's a much so lovely. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Is that? I don't know if that's me. Hello, um, I'm Mike, and I'm going to talk about a 25-year-old movie. So. Oh, and hurt all your ears. Is that me? Is that not me? That's you. If you don't touch it, it's fine. Awesome. Cool, like most of my games. Um, okay. <laughs> so, it's 1997. Um, at E3, a young developer stands on stage. He's showing a game which is the 3D reimagining of his 2D epics. It's the, finally the moment where technology's caught up with him. And he's very excited. He shows a trailer for his movie-like game. Metal Gear Solid became a cinematic, the epitome, I guess, of the cinematic game style. It became a poster boy for that approach to making games. But very quickly, uh, the cinematic label became negatively associated. It became something we, we should be embarrassed about. I imagine the title of my slide has made a few people giggle. Oh God, he's going to tell us about the three-act structure. Or, <laughs> you know, has another guy found a copy of Save the Cat and wants to tell us about it? And I've been to those talks, and it's, it's, it's something that's interesting that game designers often get kind of hung up on this stuff, because we want the easy answers. But I think there's a risk in what we've done. I think we've, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to what we can learn from film and those blue screens. You remember what was up there. Um, <laughs> we, we've, we've ignored and we've forgotten, I think, to a, lot, a large extent, all the things that we can learn from films because we got a little bit pissed off with designers wishing they were Martin Scorsese. And, and I, think, I think we can do things. I think we can do things that are cooler than what we've done. Um, we keep talking about you know, the citizen gain of games. Maybe technology-wise we have hit that, but I don't think we've got Die Hard yet, so I kind of like to talk about Die Hard, basically. This is me as a 14-year-old talking to you all about a film I loved. I think action movies are relevant. I think they're a great place to learn about games from, because what are games if not a sequence of actions which tell a story? And that's what the great action movies are like. I think we can learn a great deal about John McClane from his shootouts. We actually learn more about them from those than we do from his dialogue. So I think it's, I think it's relevant. I think we need to write games in a way, in a similar way to the way action movies were written in the late 80s. And I kind of want to talk about some of those ideas. So character arcs are something which is, oh, hello, let me drop that. Character arcs are very important to storytelling, obviously. It's something that we all have seen, oh dear. We, <laughs> I'm gonna hold it there. Um, we, we've all seen that stuff happen. We've all seen um, talks from people talking about arcs, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and it's not really relevant to games. Games are not linear fiction. But what, the one thing that is interesting from a game point of view is character development, and the idea that characters change and grow based on their experiences. They're affected by the world, and in the kind of the traditional hero narrative, which isn't the only narrative, they also affect the world. And that kind of applies to a lot of games. In terms of the acting on the world, we, we save the Earth a million times. But I don't think the other way necessarily has happened quite so, much, so many times. And I think there's a, we're a little bit scared of this. We're a bit scared of doing character development, of having characters reacting to each other and growing and doing things. Um, so we kind of cover that up a lot, especially in indie, with this kind of vague pathos thing that seems to have developed, where we, where we don't have characters communicating, we don't have an idea of who the character is or what they're doing. We just kind of give a, a general sense of vague sadness and hope that that will read as deeper than it actually is. And I think, I think there's, there's people who do that very well and have done awesome games, but I think there's a lot of other games that have kind of built on that. Or misunderstood the Gordon Freeman thing. You know, people always talk about Gordon Freeman as this silent protagonist and, and that he, he allows the player to step into his shoes. That's rubbish. Um, Gordon Freeman just talks with his gun. That's how Gordon Freeman communicates. Um, when I'm playing Gordon Freeman, I'm being Gordon Freeman. I'm not being Mike Biffle in that situation. And I think we misunderstood some of that stuff as well. And this is true of Die Hard. Um, you know, back before he got bored and angry and old, Bruce Willis was, was a charming man. So he gets a fair bit of dialogue. There's quite a bit of banter, quite a few jokes, quite a bit of that kind of content in the movie. But, but he's much more defined, as he should be in an action movie, by the actions he takes, by the sequence of events he goes through. 
There's a very interesting thing um, with Die Hard that I, I want to use as an example, just a character development thing, um, and something that I don't think we do much of in games. So, uh, if you ask people what the first shot of Die Hard is, generally they assume it's like a wide angle shot of the building, or it's, you know, Hans Gruber in his car driving up, or something like that. But the first shot of Die Hard, well, the very first shot is a, is a plane landing, but the second shot is uh, Bruce Willis's hand clenched fearfully on the uh, arm of his chair. Die Hard opens with Bruce Willis in a situation he can't control, again, with massive, you know, massive, in his view, life-threatening danger. He can't do anything about it, he's scared. And then a yuppie tells him how to solve his problem in a really patronizing way, uh, you know, the whole uh, toe curling into fists thing. And it's a funny scene and you kind of forget about it. It's very interesting then that the whole ending of the movie is Bruce Willis overcoming a situation he has no control over and, and beating that greatest of yuppies, the European, um, <laughs> who even then flies out of a window. The, the symbols and the imagery there couldn't be much more on your nose. This is the thing with late 80s cinema. They were doing this very obviously. They weren't trying to hide what they were doing. I kind of admire that. And I don't, I don't, I don't see those kind of moments necessarily in many games where, where someone is talking so much about story. We also get the damsel in distress, which is a very popular topic at the moment in, in games criticism. And um, yeah, it would, be, it would be massively stupid to say that she's an empowered woman. She's, she's not, but she's not sexually defined by the characters around her. The one character who does sexually define her, the, 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 the dickhead who I forget the name of now, who, um, who gets shot because he pretends to be Bruce's friend. It's done as, an, as a character thing about him. He's a dick. That's, that's what those sequences establish. So it was kind of quite forward looking. And that was, that was 1988, which is quite, quite surprising and quite and something that we still don't get right every time. They, they do it for everyone. Every character in that movie has a story arc, has a character arc. Um, the, the codec guy, um, uh, Al Powell, the, 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 the cop, the cop with a heart on the walkie-talkie. Even he has the arc where he shot a kid and that's why he lost his job and, and, and did all this. So he gets to kill the bad guy monster when he comes back. The bad guy monster has an arc. Uh, uh, Carl, is it Carl? It's Carl. He starts off as kind of generic thug number six. His brother is killed, he becomes angry, a quest for revenge, and then becomes kind of a Hollywood monster by the end of it. Um, so he goes through an arc. Everyone has great hair as well. Um, and then they all have these arcs that kind of progress through. And it's much more satisfying. That is much more satisfying than he was dead the whole time. Twist endings, I do watch films that don't have Bruce Willis in them. Um, <laughs> that's much more satisfying. Twist endings are a, kind of a fake candy version of this, but, but actually um, the, the satisfying stuff is when a character goes through a journey and, and you get that kind of payoff. I want to talk about the architecture as well, because obviously Nakatomi Plaza, the really obvious thing to say here was being that Nakatomi Plaza is a character, but kind of every dev diary ever has beaten me to that amazing insight. It's not a character, it's a building. Um, what it is though is it's a series of hurdles and um, blockages that, that, that characters have to overcome. It's an impediment, and the way that characters interact with the building is, is defining them in themselves. It's the best level design in, game, in, in a movie. So it starts kind of quite cleverly. It's, so it has the generic establishing shots. There's a very cool early sequence where the first thing you really see is a map of the building. It's the whole scene where they're setting up that she's taken her uh, maiden name. Um, so it does that nice little bit of story, but also establishes the space as a set of rules and, and variables and, and, and an amount of room, which is very cool. And, and then, then we then get sequences where, you know, Hans Gruber has an evil man monologue about uh, <laughs> David. <laughs> he, he has his little monologue about um, architectural models and how much he loves them. The, the, the creator of this film is a big architecture geek. The, uh, the building blog, uh, which someone pointed out to me on Twitter when I mentioned I was giving a talk about Die Hard at a video game event, um, <laughs> uh, pointed me towards um, the building blog, which, which refers to something called Nakatomi Space, which if you look back is actually now just something that's been used in so many video games. No one opens a door in Die Hard. No one walks down a corridor, jumps in an elevator, gets to the floor they want to go to and walks in. It's all about the vents and the passageways and the walkways and all that stuff. It's the, the people move through the space in an interesting way. And that says something, again, that reflects on the character. You know, Bruce Willis in this movie, I'm not typing iPad. Um, Bruce Willis in this movie is, is an interloper and he's, he's doing his thing, which is an interesting character building moment as well. 
And the, 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 the architecture reaffirms this throughout. You have all these moments where we're setting him up as we... Video games do this. Um, Splinter Cell tried to do it quite a bit. It's harder in video games, because video games you have that kind of awareness of your space. I couldn't draw you a map of a floor plan from Die Hard. Um, I could draw you a map of many, many levels from video games, just because you have a much more direct interaction with the space. So when you go into Splinter Cell and you go through a bathroom to get to the conference room, that strikes us as odd. Um, in Die Hard, it does less so. Um, so I think we can learn stuff from that, and it, you can see that, in like, especially in like the Call of Duty franchise, they're very clever with how they loop you through buildings in a, in a kind of surprising way. And, and then I'm going to get to the, the most obtuse element of this talk. So there is some good gameplay in this game as well. There's some good, if you, if you make the, the cognitive leap of, dis, of deciding that Bruce Willis is the player character, which is a, a big step, admittedly, and a little bit indulgent, he does the usual stuff, he powers up, he becomes more powerful as the story goes on. That's, that's the hero narrative. There's a very cool thing that I only noticed when I was watching this back uh, twice in a row uh, a couple of days ago in preparation for this. Um, they use signposting in that kind of classic way that we use it in, in 3D games where you know, oh, it's the Citadel, oh, it's the Citadel, but it's slightly bigger. They do that in the movie, and they do it with boobs. Um, which, is a, <laughs> which is an interesting approach. They have, um, there's, uh, there's some uh, pin-ups. In, in, in one of the corridors he runs down, sure, um, where, one of these corridors where he runs down, they have the, these images of, of ladies on the wall, and the first time he walks past it, he kind of clocks it, and it's that classic thing they have to do in action movies where they remind you of the main character straight every five minutes, um, <laughs> and he clocks it and carries on. But then he goes back past that a couple of times later in the movie, and each time lingers a little bit longer to kind of point out to the audience where he is physically. There are maps online of the uh, Fox Plaza, which is the real building this was set in, showing you where everyone died. Um, Hans Gruber is, is listed as dying on the ground floor, which is tr technically true, but it's, <laughs> it removes some of the beauty of that sequence, I think. So I'm just going to wrap it up because we're running a little bit behind. There's caveats. Obviously, there are caveats. I've just stood up in front of you and told you about why a movie's awesome and we should pay attention to that for games. Loads of them. Games don't need to be about heroes. Obviously, there's many games that haven't been. Games don't even need stories. Just Cause 2. Um, <laughs> although the VO in that game is awesome. Um, and, and the other thing is, screenwriting in movies was not finished in the 80s. It didn't end at 1988, and we've seen, you know, the likes of Charlie Kaufman have come up and done just ridiculous stuff, taking the piss literally out of this stuff, this kind of these character arcs and everything. Adaptation was entirely about the stupidity of these models. But they earned it. They're building, you know, to steal from Jurassic Park, the other great movie, um, they are, they're building on the shoulders of giants. We're not yet. We've not yet done, I don't think we've yet hit the diehard level of kind of competent, good action movie writing. Um, so I think we could, that, that, that's something to bear in mind. We need to not run before we can walk, is my point with that. Um, we can do things films can't. We're not a linear narrative thing. We are not making movies. Uh, slightly more intelligent people often say, oh, well, video games are more like television programs. That's also bollocks. I mean, they're not like television shows. They're not like anything like this. My only point in saying all of this is this stuff is clever, and there's probably some stuff we can learn from it. Um, and that's what I'm interested in. It's what Thomas was an exploration of character arcs and overlapping character arcs. And I hope that that worked and kind of satisfied an audience. But it wasn't perfect. The ending wasn't great. Um, and uh, I, I'm still learning. So I, I think we can do it. I think we need to not get too pissed off with Hideo Kojima. And we need to see if we can learn any other lessons. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to go now. Thank you.